All right, if you wish to follow along, turn to Paul's letter to the churches of Galatia, Galatians chapter 1. I am, in a sense, looking forward to this series on this book. But at the same time, I have great fear because there is so much in this book. And I don't want to gloss over it. It's short compared to Romans, but it's still just as rich as Romans is. And I'm only going to read a couple verses, but I'll give you my title. My title's this, Paul's Authority, Paul's Message. Here, Paul's Authority, Paul's Message. Now, Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Now, unlike letters like Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, for that matter, those were all letters written by Paul to an individual, one local assembly. Now, for instance, in Rome or Corinth, they may have met in different places. They may not have had a church building as we think of today. Uh, we do know, according to Paul in Romans, as, as we have seen, that some people had the church in their own house. They met in certain people's houses. But be that as it may, it, all these other books were written to one local assembly. This letter here was lit, written to at least two, because it says, unto the churches of Galatia. Now, this is important, but it's certainly not vital for us to know. But there is no such thing as the church, or the Roman church, or the Galatian church, or the Corinthian church. There is the church at Rome. There is the church uh, at Corinth. There's no such thing as the Baptist church. I will even go so far as to say there is no such thing as white churches and black churches. You hear that a lot today. Only people of religion talk like that. Now, again, I say these were letter, those other letters were letters to individual local assemblies in particular cities. Galatia was a region in what is now north central Turkey, and that just boggles my mind because as far as we know, there is no gospel in Turkey anymore. I mean, it's all Islam. It's all Muslim. Any church that is there is probably underground, Mac, at best, so to speak. But Galatia, as I said, was a region in what is now north central Turkey. It was a Roman province in Paul's time. It, at least two churches, but probably more than just two. Now, Paul, according to verse uh, chapter 4 and verse 13, and according to chapter 4, verse 14, Paul was the instrument through which these people heard the gospel. You'll see that in verse four, uh, 13. And these people were overjoyed with the apostle Paul. You'll see that in verse 14 of chapter 4. But a very serious problem had taken hold in the region. The very fact that Paul writes this to all the churches of Galatia, these Judaizers, as some people term them, these law men, but they weren't just law men, but we'll deal with that later. I'm not going to deal with that this morning. They had evidently spread through all these churches. This gives me one lesson of thought. What we hold to here can affect people in other places who fellowship with us and know us. As Earl used to quote, no man is an island. No man is an island. But this serious problem had taken hold in the region, even or especially in the churches. But here's an amazing thing. Paul does not begin this letter by railing against them, does he? Mm -mm. Look, it goes on. Next verse, verse, grace be to you and peace. You see it? In spite of their having given over to this error. Do you see it? Now, that's an amazing statement. Now, I do agree with what Don Fortner said. He preached a series where he preached one message from every book in the Bible. And he said you can detect Paul's anger in this letter. You could detect his anger. 
but his anger is toward those who had bewitched these people, not the people themselves. I know this world says we are to love everyone, but you cannot. You cannot. Dare I say we even dare not. Paul said, if any man love not our Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. Let him be accursed. The Lord is coming. Hmm. It's amazing. You don't hear too many places teaching that, do you? But again, I say Paul does not rail against them, but rather gives straightforward warnings and exhortations. Now, as I've already pointed out, I just have two thoughts this morning. Paul states his God-given authority, and there's a reason for this. And then Paul states his message. So first of all, his God-given authority, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him, that is Christ from the dead. Now, first of all, let me just, this is, this is basically just lesson right now. Apostleship, there were only 12. And I will go so far as to say the disciples after Christ's ascension picked Matthias, but you remember how they picked him? This is, this is a metaphor, this is an illustration. I don't know exactly. Yeah. They rolled the dice. Now we know, I, I, I'm sure that one of them probably thought, you know, the lot is in, they'll cast into the lap, but the whole disposing there is, is of the Lord. But Matthias was not the 12th, what well, the 12th, <laughs> Paul was. Now how do I know there was only 12? Because Christ said there would be only 12, and I'm not going to read it, but you can read it later, Matthew 19, 27, and 28. Twelve apostles. Twelve apostles. Paul was directly ordained of God to be an apostle. He was the twelfth. But an apostle is this. One who is, this is the literal meaning of the word, one who is sent out. One who, had, one who is a special emissary, an actual eyewitness with personal instruction from Jesus Christ himself. And Paul alludes to that, though he doesn't say it to where I, have, I could be dogmatic about it. But he said in verse 15, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, that's the Gentiles, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went out to Jerusalem to them that were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again into Damascus. Christ taught Paul himself. There is a real sense in which none of us can say that. Now, yes, God is our teacher, but he uses means. He uses means. Now, so that we see that as apostle. Now, think about this. According to the scripture, the gospel was their sole message. Our Lord told the eleven, go ye into all the world and preach. What? What? The gospel. The gospel. Now, there are many other, as I've said before, there are many, many other topics in the scripture, and they must be dealt with, but they must center or have as their center Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Must be. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized, be saved. Believe what? The gospel. The gospel. Secondly, they had authority to insist on Christ's doctrine. Turn to Matthew 28. I want to read that. One. They had the authority to insist, to command obedience to Christ's doctrine. Matthew chapter 28, verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, well, Paul's already quoted, All power is given unto me, in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Now, I want you to think about that. Right now, he's already told them. He's told them the Gentiles are going to be included. I don't think they got it. Peter didn't get it at first, did he? He didn't get it for, for months, or at least, or weeks at least. 
Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now, how do I put this? I'm going to state it like, like I've got it here, but then I, I want to deal with it a little more. An apostle was, an, was a special ascension gift of Jesus Christ himself. When he went back to glory, he gave gifts unto men. Now turn to Ephesians 4. We'll read that. We'll read where that is stated. Ephesians chapter 4. Now, before I read those verses, let me say this. Because error has to be exposed. It must be exposed. I'm sure there are certain denominations, certain ilks of so-called Christianity, when they think about ascension gifts, what do they think about? Tongues? Hmm? Healing? Yeah, prophecy? All of these things in which everybody can be involved, right? It's not what the Apostle Paul wrote. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. And let's just let me start at the first of the verse, first of the chapter. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation with where you're called. Now, don't let anybody ever tell you that your walk doesn't matter. It does matter. But it doesn't gain you one ounce of merit before God. But it still matters. With all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. Why? Because we're hard to bear with. We're hard to bear with. You see it? Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Keeping it, not make it. If we make it, it could be broken. And let me go so far to say if we make it, it probably ought to be broken. But this is peace isn't a peace. This is that peace that is established by God in the person of Jesus Christ. There is how many? One body. You remember that guy sang the song Pity this morning we was listening to? Very beautiful singing. But he talks talked about that John Newton pastored several different Christian bodies. No. It's wrong choice of words. Maybe several different Christian assemblies, local assemblies, but there is how many bodies? One. Whether they meet at Crow or whether they meet down in Rocky Mount or they meet in Dingus, there is how many bodies? One. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. But look at it. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. You have exactly the amount of grace that you need in any specific time. Now we ought to seek more grace. We ought to cry out for more grace. But he'll give it. He'll give it. But look. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Do you see that? Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above the uh, far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So that's in parentheses. Now he continues. What is these gifts? And he gave some what? Apostles. And they're at the top of the list. Why? Somebody said, but why? It's not because of them. It's because of God. Amen. This is the way God ordained it. This is the way it is. And he gave some apostles and some prophets. And by my understanding, what I see from this, from the scripture, these were not men that simply foretold about the future, but men who were given special gift and understanding of the Old Testament and how the Old Testament spoke of Christ. They had a gift from God, but they were also a gift from God. Now, that's what I'm pointing out. And some evangelists, now that is not the preacher who comes and preaches a week meeting. 
I was always brought up, you know, the evangelist comes at least once a year, preaches a revival meeting. This is not an evangelist. This is a person who takes the gospel where the gospel was never preached before. Look at it. And some what? Pastors and teachers. Now that boggles my mind. And I do not mean this, as God is my witness, I do not mean this in a boasting way, but men who are sent of God as pastor teachers are a gift from God. Treat them that way. Treat them that way. Do you like to be encouraged in what you do? God's men need to be encouraged in what they do. When they come here or any other place every Sunday, Time after time after time, and people just walk out that door. It makes them wonder, are they really hearing what God's given me to say? Have they heard it so long that it no longer affects them and moves them? God help us. Now, I'm talking about me too because we have two other men that stand here almost every Sunday and preach to us. God help us. We need encouragement. And somebody said, but if I brag on them, it may swell their head. Their head swelled already. It's already swelled. I mean, the very fact that I know that if God truly sent me, I am one of the ascension gifts of Christ, it swells my head. But God brings me low nonetheless. You see, do you see the magnitude of this? And I think about this. This is for us. It may be for other places. We have three men that can ably preach the gospel. And we know of some of our sister assemblies, they're struggling to find just one. And I say this not to be mean or overbearing. We've got a lot of younger preachers. But they refuse to take a pastorate. I, I, don't, Mac, I don't understand that. What did God put you in the ministry for? To be an evangelist and preach five-day meetings? No. Mm -mm. What do we see now? The only thing I know we have now is this evangelist, pastor teachers. That's what we got. Now the apostles are gone. We don't need prophets to have special insight into the Old Testament. We have the New Testament that explains the Old Testament to us. But we do need evangelists. Men that God will send. I, I think of, I can't even think of his name now, they went down to Mexico. I mean, he had. Five or six kids, Walter Gruber went down to Mexico, had five or six kids. One of them was just an infant. And he was so impressed to go to preach to the Mexicans in Mexico. And there were people who were criticizing. You don't love your family. You don't love your children. You don't love your parents or your wife's parents. And for almost a year, they suffered. I mean, his wife got down to 92 pounds, I'm told. Why? Because God meant to send him to Mexico to preach to the elect that were there. We ought to thank God for men like that. We ought to thank God for men like Earl Cochran that comes into this county years ago, Ellen, and preached the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. Hmm. But look, but there's a reason for this, these gifts. See it? What? For the perfecting of the saints. You are not your own pastor. I am not my own pastor. Earl Cochran was my pastor, and Joe and Paul still pastor me today as they preach the truth. For the perfecting of the... You're not your own pastor. You're not your own brother or sister. You're not your own leader. You're not your own guide. You're definitely not your own authority, and neither am I. But these men God sends out, they have an authority. Now, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cutting craftiness whereby they lay in wait to deceive. And there are thousands of them out there. And some of them are really good at what they do. You can listen to some of them preach and you think, man, I think he knows the truth. But when you listen to him for very long, you find out just like, just like old Earl, just like old Earl used to say, even a blind hog will find a nut every once in a while. 
They're hucksters out here. And you remember what Paul told us to do about these hucksters, don't you? Avoid them. Avoid them. Okay? Mm. But speaking the truth in love. That does not say speak your mind. We don't need you to speak your mind. You don't need me to be speaking my mind. If I spoke my mind, you'd probably put me out of here. Because you won't, don't want to know what I always think. Do they, Penny Jo? Mm -mm. she, she answered that one in the affirmative quick. Mm -hmm. But speaking what? The truth. And here's the, here's the, when I was young, I didn't know much about that. I knew about speaking the truth, Ellen, but I don't know how much love was in it. <laughs> I don't know how much love was in it. I, I'm, I've, I don't now, but I've listened to some of my older messages and said, I don't know how in the world Earl Cochran put up with that young whippersnapper behind that podium for all that time. Mm. And I understand why you couldn't put up with me now, because I know a little bit about me. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him. And now, notice that. It's not just grow up. All of so-called Christianity is talking about growing, growing, being better. This is grow up how? In him. Miss Penny and I were talking, we were listening to some songs this morning. You know, this world wants God to reward them. They want to serve God for God to reward them. They don't understand that God himself is the reward. That he would reveal himself to such despicable creatures as a, who are his enemies by nature. And to him to open my eyes to so here I am. Look at this book. I've showed you who I am. That boggles my mind. I don't deserve it. Jack, I don't, I don't even deserve to even see it, let alone have the responsibility to stand here and declare it to others publicly. And that weighs upon me deeply. The older I get, the more forgetful I get, Rid, it weighs upon me even more deep. And I remember our dear pastor and brother Earl Cochran telling me, he said, Walter, I'm just, I'm afraid to get behind the podium. This was in his last, you know, months or years, whatever it was. I'm afraid to get behind the podium because I'm afraid of what I'll say. That takes the grace of God. You know, and his, he, he realized his mind would wander and, that I, I mentioned that to Don Fortner, of course, before Don died, of course. And I said, if he'd have said something wrong, how, how would I have told him, Earl, that's not right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. How would I have told him? And you know what Don, Don looked at me and said, you couldn't. <laughs> Thank God God did it the way he did it. Hmm? That man and every other man that stood here, whether they're your, your personal pastor or not, is a gift from God. God. Hmm. Now, let's just move on. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly, think about it, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. How do I put I, I don't, if I don't say this exactly right, you forgive me for it and Paul or Joe could correct me the right way to say it later, but we feed on one another as well as feeding on Christ. Our fellowship together, though it may be a small one, is for our spiritual good. I shudder to think if God killed all of y'all and left me here by myself. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Oh yeah, I could go somewhere else, but that's not the point. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the... But don't, aren't you glad it don't depend on us? You see it? Look. Look. According to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body and the edifying of itself in love. God is having his way with us. And if you feel like you don't know much, Listen to me. Be glad. <laughs> Be glad. Because none of us, none of us, me included, knows anything yet as we ought to know it. 
I don't even, Penny and I talked about this as well, I don't even know the true depth of my depravity. I think if I did, Jack, in this state, if God really showed me what I'm like in his sight, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't live. I couldn't function. Hmm? I have a difficult time knowing what little bit I do know about myself. Let's move on. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth, what? Walk. But here's the negative. Walk not as other Gentiles walk in the emptiness of the mind. Boy, don't we see that today. Now, I'm gonna, I might as well say this. I mean, when you, when, you, when you can go to the job site and tell your boss that you identify as a cat and you want a litter box to do your business in, that's an empty mind. Huh? And you say, that, that don't really happen. That's really happening. It's really happening. Hmm. And the emptiness of their mind. Here we go. Having... The understanding darkened. You see that? Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Oh, brothers and sisters, apart from the grace of God, that would be me. That would be me. I'd be one of those unbelieving wretches. But thank God. Even though I'm wretched, bless God, I am a believing wretch. Hmm? Look at it. Who being uh, past feeling. Now, we don't think of all you see out there as a recent development. It's always been there. And in certain ages, especially in Paul's day, there were people that practiced such lewd things and it was out in the open. And in certain countries, those things are suppressed. But even in our own country now, what is it? They pull them back the walls, pull them back the rules, pull them back the laws. And men and women begin to show themselves for what they really are. And by nature, I am just like them. Although this frightens me, I, apart from the providence of God Almighty, could be a Charles Manson. Penny sees that on the road. Mm, thank God it's not legal to shoot people you don't like. We're the same way. It's just God Almighty didn't let us over, turn us over. He didn't let us go. Hmm? who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Do you see it? I will have my way. Hmm? Let's give you a case in point. A, now baby, I don't have the right words. But a male who identifies as a female is allowed to go into whatever restroom he wants in his school, 13, 14, 15 year olds. He, he, this male who identifies as a female, goes into the female restroom and sexually assaults a young woman and the school covers it up. And it comes out in the board meeting and the father of the girl is upset because people's covering this up and they haul him off and put him in jail, and arrest him, put him in jail. And were it not for the governor of Virginia pardoning the man, he probably would still be in jail. Now you tell me if this world ain't topsy-turvy. Hmm? Topsy-turvy. But ye have not so learned Christ. Now if you think that's the way even a believer can think, you're dead wrong. You're dead wrong. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have, heard him, and been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. <clears throat> Put off all that stuff. And it, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Isn't that what he says? Everything that has to do with the old you, put it off. And you got to do that over and over and over and over. 
and over. It, it, you'll never win the battle in this world, but you still keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off, right? If you don't, it'll consume you. Hmm? That you put off concerning the former way of life, conversation. That's not just what you say, it's how you act, or no, how you conduct yourself, better word. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, why? Which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. Hmm. And that doesn't have to be just immorality. Even our righteousnesses are filthy rags in God's sight. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. There is some good in us, but there is no good in our flesh. Now, I don't know how to explain that, but it's, it's simply a fact. I am both old man, but thank God I am also new man. And I've mentioned, this only dawned on me in the past few years, and I've been preaching for almost 40 years. What I have in the new man doesn't need improvement. It's the very thing I'll have when I get to glory. I'm just going to drop this flesh. I won't be better than I am now in Christ. When I get to glory, I'll just drop this flesh and the old man completely. Isn't that amazing? It's there in us. No, even more. He is there in us. Hmm. And then Paul goes on, wherefore, putting away. And he tells us these things. This is, you know, it's not an exhaustive list, but we're so forgetful, we've got to be reminded that lying is wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's so, it's so easy for my tongue to utter a lie. And I look back and say, why did I say that? You ever done that? Wasn't even intending jack on lying and still lie like a dog, as they say. Aren't you glad God gave us these gifts to keep telling us and telling us and telling us? And I have to keep reminding myself and reminding myself. But move on. Paul had authority. What Paul said went when it came from Christ. And what Walter says, what Joe says, what Paul says goes when it comes from this book. It goes. It stands, no matter how much I may chafe under it. Hmm? Okay, Paul now states his message that God the Father raised Jesus Christ from the dead. We don't preach just Christ crucified. We preach Jesus Christ, a living, reigning, ascended Lord. We preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, hear me now. Think about this. Oh, God, help us to put on this, what, being renewed in what the spirit of your mind. Think about this. Christ's birth and life only is not the gospel. But there are people who think they're saved because they believe that Christ was born and lived in this world. Listen to me. Christ's death only is not the gospel. You can believe in the birth and life and death and still not be saved. Here's another thought. The facts, the facts of Christ's birth, life, death, and resurrection only are not the gospel. But yet that's what I was raised to believe. In that religious place I was basically born and raised in. If you believe in the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, well, you're a Christian. That ain't so. Look at Romans chapter 1. Now you know this. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. Now, move on to verse 3. What is it? 
concerning his son, Jesus Christ the Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. As I've said over and over again, with all the conflict in the world, all of that conflict and hatred toward Jews that is over there in the, in the Far East right now, you will bow to a circumcised Jew or you will perish. Amen. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You're going to bow to a circumcised Jew or you will perish. Yeah. Yeah. And he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. But look, and declared to be. Do you see it? He wasn't made this one. He already and has always been this one. He said, he was made. You see, it was made of the seed of David according to the flesh but, and declared to be the Son of God with what? Authority and might. The Christ of God is not this weak, sissified, effeminate Jesus that is pawned off on men and women in this day. You believe in that Jesus. I don't care what you believe about him. You are lost. You are lost. Declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness. His holiness. By the resurrection from the dead. The very fact that God raised him up from the dead, God said, that man's holy. Hmm? My only hope of such a resurrection is to be where? In him. In him. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 1, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Now, we're, we're about to hear something now, aren't we? Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which, which I have preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory that which I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. So there is a vain believing. All believing is not good. Some believing is empty. It's still believing, but it's empty believing. Huh? I'll go so far as to say you can be a five-point Calvinist and still not know the gospel. Amen. That's right. For I, de I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. Here it is. How that Christ died for our sins. And here it is. According to the scriptures. In the Old Testament, when a sacrifice was offered, what had to take place next? What had to take place next? The sin must be forgiven. Yeah. Hmm? Isn't that what all the Old Testament teaches? The sin must be forgiven. What are we going to teach about Christ today? Well, he died for your sins, but that's not good enough. Yeah. You've got to make it worthwhile. You've got to make it effectual. You have to make it apply. You can't. It's not about you seeing the blood. It's about God Almighty. About God the Father seeing the blood. That's the whole past. That's, that's the Old Testament scripture, isn't it? What did, when I pass through, when I pass through uh, Egypt, I'll slaughter the firstborn of every male, cattle, horses, dogs, every, cats, everything. Go kill the firstborn. And God said, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Aren't you glad? God saw the blood. Because I don't always see the blood. Do you? He ever sees the blood. Though it was shed but one time. Hmm. Now look, we're not done. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. Notice the emphasis. According to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of about five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this day, to this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, and then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. Now look at it. For I... This is Paul, Paul, Paul knew this. He was, he was an apostle, right? With authority, had the care, daily care of the churches. Not one church, not just one church like me or you, Paul, Joe. Hmm? For I am the least of the apostles. That I am not meet, not qualified to be called an apostle. 
because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. You see it? Hmm? And his grace which was bestowed upon me, what was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I. Paul refuses to take one percent, even a, even a fraction of a percent of the credit. Right? I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? And he goes on to this thing about the resurrection. You see, there, here's, here's the, now turn to Romans 5. And this, is, this is, I have to confess, this is one of my favorite passages. This, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the last part of it. Turn to Romans 5, I'll read a few verses. Here, here we're going to talk about the gospel. Okay, the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is this. It is the certain results of Christ's birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension. It is the certainty of what he accomplished when he died on that tree and God raised him from the dead. And this is what Paul gives us in Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For when we were yet without strength. So how much strength did we have? Zero. Zero. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for who? The ungodly. You see, ungodly. Now, there are, I will say, there's a lot of sinners in this world, but not too many of them are ungodly sinners, are they? <laughs> them people I talked about when they identify as a cat. Oh, yeah, of course they're ungodly. No, I am ungodly. It's good to be ungodly. Because only ungodly people have hope in Christ. He didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to what? Repentance. Hmm? In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. I thank God for that. Hmm. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet what? Sinners. Christ died. He didn't die for us because we deserved it. He died for us in spite of the fact that we had merited his wrath and anger. Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified, how? By his blood. And somebody will say, well, I need more justification than that. You can't get no more than that. There is no more than that. Well, I need to be justified in my own actions. You better stop. You better throw it off. That's the old man. Hmm? Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And I love that the Spirit of God moved because now he's going to explain exactly what he's saying so you can't twist it around. Although men still try to, nonetheless. For if, when we were what? enemies not believers not not regenerated and converted if for if when we were what enemies we were reconciled to god how by the death of his son now you ever get to that point you'll say christ died for just some people because some people die and go to hell not reconciled to god those for whom he died, he reconciled them to God when he died. That's the truth. Whether that's Calvinism or any other ism, I really don't care what the ism is. That's the truth. You see it? For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled. And in the actual Greek, you could put it in having been reconciled. Being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. 
He lives to make sure everyone he died for will be with him in glory. He prayed that. Recorded in John 17, correct? He prayed that. Look, and not only this, not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the reconciliation. That's the actual word. We've received it. Paul, you're right. Aren't you glad God didn't just have his son die for you and you have to wait till you get to glory to find out whether you want his or not? Wouldn't that be a miserable existence? Huh? It would drive you mad, wouldn't it? So who did he die for? Ungodly people. Amen. Sinners. And if you're hearing me preach this message, if you know you're ungodly, I have the right to tell you Christ died for you. But if you don't think you're ungodly, you've got no right to think Christ died for you. Well, that's just the way it is. Just the way it is. But thank God if he died for you, one day you will receive the very reconciliation that he's already wrought when he died. I like that, don't you? Folks, that's how God saved me. And as that one young preacher asked me <coughs> at Penny's dad's funeral, or actually his, his actual committal, what the funeral was that we just had the committal. We buried his body in the ground. And he said, oh, you could, he said you could always tell a Calvinist when you hear one. Well, you know. <laughs> and he, but he asked me these words. He said, well, when do you, when do you start believing this, these things? I said, when God saved me. When God saved me. Why? Because he thinks you don't have to believe the truth of Jesus Christ to be saved. Now, he wouldn't put it that way. I know that. He don't believe those things, but he considers himself to be saved. Do you believe that when Christ died, those he died for, he reconciled? Do you believe that those he reconciled shall be saved because he lives? It's one or the other, Jack. Yeah. You, can't, you can't have it both ways. You either believe that or you don't believe the gospel. Amen. You can believe in the birth, life, death, burial, resurrection, asc ascension. You can believe in all that and still perish if you reject the truth about what he actually did when he died on that tree. Because that, my brothers and sisters, is the gospel. Jesus Christ and him, what? Crucified. And it means more than just he died there. It's what did he do when he died there? He saved some people. <laughs> he saved some, he, he reconciled some people. He justified some people. He sanctified some people. Hmm. So what's my conclu conclusion? Amen. That's what I say. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for the food we're about to partake of, the fe fellowship we, we seek to have. Lord, thank you for your son. Be with Joe and Debbie and, and others. Uh, we think of Paul and the, the, the neighbor of, of Mac and Sandy. Lord, we just do give them comfort. Lord, we, we, we don't know whether to ask for healing or what, Lord, we, but just give them comfort. May their eyes, may their ears, may their hearts be stayed upon Jesus Christ. In his name, amen.